And welcome back to the fifth episode of the Wellness Paradox Podcast. I'm so grateful that you've joined us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Staff, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomenon that I call the wellness paradox. That is the gap between what we know as a health sciences community and what we actually implement in the real world to make a real difference with real people. This podcast is about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that today, I'm so delighted to be joined by Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. Dr. Hayes is the founder of a therapy movement called ACT which is acceptance and commitment therapy, or in other contexts when it's used outside of the clinical setting, referred to as acceptance or commitment training. This is going to be an amazing conversation, I think, for everyone, because Dr. Hayes is going to hit on some things that I think we're all very aware of in our own life. So this is not just a conversation about psychopathology and about therapy and how to treat depression or anxiety, because ACT certainly can do that. But the ACT framework is about so much more than that as Dr. Hayes will explain during the course of the conversation. Dr. Hayes started his research on ACT in the early 80s, spent a lot of time very rigorously devoted to the scientific process of building an evidence base. And this evidence base has really exploded since the year 2000, not only in the peer-reviewed journals, but also in a lot of the lay publications. I think we're going to find this conversation has a lot of applicability to health, wellness, and behavior change, but also to your own life. With that being said, if there's any information that you would like to learn about Dr. Hayes or anything that we share in the podcast, you can go to our website in the show notes page at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode five for more information. And I truly hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. Well, we're joined by Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for joining us on the Wellness Paradox podcast. Yeah, great to be here and looking forward to it. So this is a discussion I'm very excited about. I actually have followed ACT, which we're going to talk about today for several years. I've actually used it in my own life uh, for just improvement in my overall health and well-being and to actually work through some anxiety issues. So not only is this a very exciting conversation for everyone to listen to, but it's also very exciting for me to talk to the person that was responsible for for founding a system that I've actually uh, used in my own life. And I see your book, A Liberated Mind, over your shoulder there, which is a book I think I've read through probably three times now. So uh, I want to dive right into it because there's so many things I want to talk about that I want to make sure we have time. So Great. for starters, let's just tell us a little bit more about you and your background and, and your journey and, and what led you to you know, create this, this framework for psychological flexibility and flourishing. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist, and, but I'm also interested in basic research on language and cognition. I got into psychology the way most psychologists do, just by watching suffering in my own home as a child, and then dealing with it just uh, in myself. And you mentioned anxiety issues that developed a panic disorder, and my mom had a OCD, my dad was an alcoholic, and I could see the relevance uh, of it, but didn't know kind of how to approach it. The way that I've come in is to try to really dig down into the smallest set of processes, of sequences, of things you do that make a big difference in either leading to problems or prosperity. And really going through that in a piecemeal way, one step at a time. So in the early, early days when we developed some, we thought good ideas, we did some quick tests of it. And then almost went dark because for 16 years, we did nothing except basic research, even philosophy of science work, measurement components. And then finally, about the turn of the century, came out with a a book. And then it became a self-help book. And then it was written up in Time magazine. And for one glorious week, I beat uh, Harry Potter and selling that book became the number one, uh, you know, self-help book for a little while. And that was my five minutes of fame. And it... uh, catapulted me into the overnight sensation that took 20 years to produce. We're now 
40 years into the journey. And so what I can sit here with, um, we're about to announce today, as a matter of fact, I know this will be shown a little later, but that uh, in terms of randomized controlled trials on ACT, uh, we're now, uh, we were busted through the 500 barrier, we're at 616. There's about three to four or 5,000, depending how you parse it, studies on the processes. So we're sitting atop a ginormous amount of data from a very large community, more than 10,000 professionals who follow and pursue this work, either professionally or research. And so it does allow me to sit here and to say to folks that they're listening that I think we've got the smallest set of processes that do the most things in mental health, behavioral health, physical health, social well-being, social problems than any other set known in behavioral science by far. And that includes traditional CBT and other things that are very well supported. We're part of the CBT community, but a particular uh, wing of it. And why does that matter? Why would a normal person matter? Because if you can learn the five or six things that make a critical difference in life, and put those skills into your life so that you can use it when you need it. And if you can do it in area after area after area, whether you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis or you need to lose weight or you develop an anxiety problem or, you know, by the way, uh, you're running a business and it's really challenging, you're feeling stressed and burned out and on and on it goes. That's just an awesome skill set to have and Western science can be of help not just in telling you what works, your experience alone and enough exploration might tell you that, but also telling you how to simplify. A good scientific theory makes it simpler. And uh, we've been able to do that, I think. So, um, you know, life is asking you to learn these processes. The sooner you learn them, the better you'll do. So uh, let's get on with it and try to put it into our, our, our hands and our heads and our hearts in a way that transform our lives. Yeah, what a, what a fascinating journey to, to create uh, such a, uh, not just a robust framework, but also the research that supports it and the, you know, the practitioners and the studies. And it's, that's not, I guess uh, my question here, because I want to dive into the framework, but I'm curious to know, like when this whole thing started, when you started to come up with these ideas, did you have any notion that it was going to grow into what it's growing into? I, I did. And, you know, I'm part of the behavioral tradition and a particular wing. It'll surprise the uh, listeners to hear it because mostly people judge that wing without really understanding. But I came out of the Skinnerian behavior analytic wing. And, you know, the single most famous book he wrote is probably Walden too. It's a utopian novel. And that's why I'm a behaviorist. You know, I was initially a humanist and, you know, interested in Abraham Maslow and peak experiences and all those kinds of things. But I had this hard science commitment. And a lot of those folks, including Maslow, said you can't really do human sciences the way you do experimental science. And I understand why. It's because it involves language, meaning, purpose, values, all these kind of things. That's why we spent those dark years. We even developed a theory of language and cognition that now has five, 600 studies behind it. If you have a kid who's not able to talk, I suggest you look up relational frame theory because it can really help in acquiring language and, and moving it forward. But, you know, that kind of from rats to Walden to vision is part of my tradition, number one. And number two, um, when these processes started transferring my, my own life and I started seeing what was happening with my clients and then realized how broadly they applied. In the first few studies we did, we showed you could help you lose weight, you could help deal with pain, and they can help do with depression. That's, that was the first three studies done in the early 80s. We put them in the file drawer, not because we were hiding the data. There were great, great studies, but because we weren't ready, we knew it. And this is back before people were saying mindfulness and before the John Cabot Zins and all that. And to me, going as a sort of a child of the 60s and a person who sat on a hippie hill in the summer of love, it kind of seemed weird that I would come in as a behaviorist and end up talking about things like acceptance and mindfulness and sense of self and all of that, all that kind of stuff. And so we had to do that, that careful development work. But the thing that's really made the difference, and maybe you sort of sense that I'm very proud of it, is that we took the time to build community. 
And the reason why there's 10,000 folks in that society is not because it's active or all us, it's not top down. Some of the things we do, like you can't certify therapists, you can't make proprietary claims. You know, we push to the side this tendency of founders to create a hierarchy with them on top, telling other people what to do and what the real act is and so forth. And when you do that, you got disciples and the best minds don't wanna be disciples. The best minds wanna put their own mark on what they do. And so I came out of a political uh, background. I was a full-time political operative doing community organizing for uh, uh, you know, Earth Day and uh, environmental causes even before I went to graduate school. And I knew I'd learned that it's not individuals that make a difference, it's groups. And so we've taken these processes, we've applied them to our own scientific group and it's drawn people in and they get all excited and they start seeing a values-based place where they could put their professional effort. So the reason there's those thousands of studies is not because of me, it's because I got out of the way. Yeah. I mean, it's because I was, and people following were way more careful to lift up and put the light on the younger folks who are the, the future of any effort and on the group working together. So, um, it's, uh, I knew from the beginning that this was important and I had faith that a group working together, initially a small group, me and five students, but now thousands of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing it ever has. Groups working together, that's how it works. And so uh, I made a bet with my graduate student uh, back in the day, El Elgo Wolfert, who was a dean at the, uh, uh, University of Albany for, for, for many years and just now retiring, but she had to pay off. I bet her that by the early 2000s, ACT would be at the center of evidence-based therapy. And it was almost laughable at the time because you know we'd give talks and five people would come. But I just thought this is so important. If we can do that bottom-up basic science and simplify it down to processes, you know, so I can just say in a few words what's really important. Man, that's going to be so awesome. And and we didn't know how to get there, but we did get there. Uh, and I mean, but not that we stopped. We're still developing. We're still adding and tracking and modifying and so forth. But uh, we overcame a lot of the big challenges uh, that behavioral psychology had. And um, you've seen it in the reception that it's gotten worldwide. Fascinating journey. Well, I, I don't want to hold anyone in suspense any longer in terms of talking about the, the processes, because I think as much exposure as, as ACT has gotten, I think you hear people talk about CBT and they sort of have a general understanding of that, but I think you know ACT is still something that's not quite as well understood. So for the person who's never heard of ACT before, how would you explain it generally speaking and then getting into those processes a little bit more specifically? Well, I usually start by uh, asking some, the person to do something, it gives them an intuitive feel because I make the claim usually early on that life itself has given you wisdom that the organ between your ears doesn't even realize or recognize uh, that you have. And that when I walk through these things, you'll kind of have a sense of, oh, of course, I know that. And you do know that, in part because it's in our culture and our spiritual traditions and wisdom traditions and deeper clinical traditions, but it's also there in your deep experience of being human. And so if you could permit me a 30 second uh, task that will prove that I will then unpack it and I'll unpack it into six things. Actually, I'll present it as three things and then show that each has two features, but it's really one thing, it's all together. It's like six sides of a box. You only have a box when you have all six sides strong enough to make a box. And if you just have a square on the floor, that's not a box. And so these things can't be seen except in relationship to each other. But here's the, the 30 second challenge. Think of something that is really hard for you, uh, an experience, emotion, thought, et cetera, that punches you hard, that really is difficult for you to handle. Self-judgment, a memory, a painful experience, emotions you feel, sensations you have. And then imagine you're a sculptor and your body is the sculpting like you did statues when you were a kid. And in your mind's eye, or if you're not in, in a private room, actually do it put your body in the shape that would communicate to somebody walking through that sculpture garden, what it's like to be you when dealing with that issue at your worst. 
and just let your gut sense do that. Just show it with your body. And then do the same and flip it, the same exact issue. Sometimes you handle it better than others. You, at your best, put your body in that form. And take a little mental snapshot. And I can pretty much tell you what you did. Because we've done this. We have hundreds of pictures like this from around the world. Whether you're wearing burkas, a loincloth, or a three-piece suit, what happens with you at your worst is you begin to close down, defend, to show a flop, fail, freeze, uh, uh, flee, fight, posture, some combination of that. The most common ones, close your eyes, move your head down, bring your arms, hands in, bend at your waist, pull your knees up, start heading towards a fetal position. People literally will sometimes fall on the floor and curl up in a fetal position or put their hands over their head. I'll unpack that in a second, but then let's go to what you did intuitively, do it your best. And my guess is your head came up, your eyes opened, your body loosened, your arms and hands went out away from your body. You might even stood up and spread your feet instead of, and you're free to kind of look around. Well, what, what does that show? Here's one thing it shows. Eyes closed, looking inward, you're not ready to contact the world. You're not aware of what's going on in the world. Arms and hands pulled in and defending, you're not ready to engage and deal uh, with the world. And it shows a metaphor for being closed, defended, fearful, protective, freezing, as if, uh, you know, feigning death, you know, like what reptiles do. Well, that's exactly right. Here are the six processes. You need to learn to sort of metaphorically stand up, open your eyes and spread your arms out to your own history, your own thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations. You need to be able to see those, observe them, describe them, appreciate them without running from them, fighting from them, denying them, trying to change them, and having this little mental space that I only get to move forward in my life when I don't have those things, but there's no delete button in the nervous system, so there's no way to start from there. There's no healthy way to start from not having the history you have. Short of a brain injury, you have that history and it's part of you, right? So that's one, emotional and cognitive openness and flexibility. The metaphor of opening your eyes and lifting your head up and being able to look around from one place or another is to allocate your attention in a flexible, fluid, voluntary way that's useful to your present purposes from this awareness, that part of you that's behind your eyes of looking as an aware human being. I here now am aware of this and this and this, shifting, staying, broadening, narrowing, and what you look at, metaphorically, what you contact on purpose, what you intend to, in a flexible, fluid, and voluntary way. That's the second set of processes of uh, being more aware. And then the last one is arms and hands out, free to grasp, standing up, feet out, free to move, of being engaged in life. When you see something of what's so important, so you can head towards it, put your hands on it, do something, move it around, you know, change things. So here are the three then, open, aware, and actively engaged. Open means cognitively and emotionally open. Aware means attentional flexibility from this more spiritual or purely aware part of you. And actively engaged means creating values-based habits, doing habitually what you really want to be about and not what you really don't want to be about. If uh, those six things in there with three pillars, open, aware, and active, but it's really one thing, we call it psychological flexibility. And it's in its negative form, predictive of pathology, and its positive form is predictive of prosperity in almost every area of life you can name. And I sometimes play with podcasts. I play stump the chump. I say, you name something, any problem, anything, anywhere. And with almost three, four, five thousand studies sitting on it, uh, I'm like a spider in the middle of a web. I know a lot of them. I have read all of them, but I know a lot of them. I bet you I can say, yeah, in fact, we've done a study that shows that. And whether it's dealing with diabetes or losing weight or it's cancer diagnosis or, you know, dealing with uh, enacted prejudice towards you if you're a minor sexual minority or an ethnic minority or setting up work teams that work or on and on it goes, it, psychological flexibility goes everywhere human mind goes. So that's 
the story, but you knew it already. You showed it to me with your body. So it's just uh, putting it, what science can do sometimes is just simplify. It says, here are the six things, ding, ding, ding. You wrap your head around it, really get it, understand it. When you learn one area, you can move it to the other area. And that's cool. But life itself will teach you that. It's just slower and less precise. So you want to learn it by a bloody nose or you want to learn it by reading and practicing. You know, you can, you, know, you can pick your way, but you're probably going to be asked to learn it because life's going to ask it of you by giving you failure challenges, anxiety challenges, uh, death of friend challenges, loss challenges, etc. cetera. And uh, you're going to pass those challenges or not. And if you pass them well, you're probably doing it by learning to be more flexible. Yeah, uh, that's, and I, I've read that, but to hear hear you say it and explain it is just, it, it's fascinating. And, and you are right, as I did that mental exercise in my head, as you were talking about it, it was the, you know, fetal position nearly sitting and then, you know, the open, upright, you know, erect posture. And I, I would almost guarantee everyone that was doing that exercise listening to this podcast was in exactly the same position. It's, it's fascinating. It's you know, we've scored those pictures and literally we have people sitting with uh, underneath the gum gum trees or didgeridoos or people in burkas or people in three piece suits and they do the same thing. It's not a cultural thing. It's a human thing. I mean, cultures move these things around some degree, but uh, no, I, I, I think life itself will give you that experience. But here's the, here's the sad thing, though. Even though you know that and you showed it with your body that you know that. If you had a panic attack right now, and I'm talking as a panic disorder person in recovery, so I know what that's like on the inside out, your mind would scream at you to run, hide, pretend, put on the mask, don't let them see it. The functional equivalent to bringing your head down and bringing your arms and hands in. That's what it would tell you is the good thing to do. You know it isn't, but you're, the, you know, the organ between your ears doesn't know that. Why? Because it's a problem solving engine. That's what it's for. It emerged for cooperation and then it became harnessed to problem solving. And when you're into problem solving, you're going to say, I don't want this and I want to get rid of that. And that's fine when you're vacuuming your floor, but it's terrible when you're dealing with your own history because you're not going to get rid of your history. Would you really want to? And so, uh, where are you going to learn if you do that? So uh, the mind is pretty stupid when it comes to yourself. It's pretty good when dealing with uh, inventing the technology that allows us to talk right now. But that doesn't mean that uh, we're masters of the universe. We're master of almost everything except us. And uh, we need to do better with that. Behavioral science can help. Yeah, and, th and it's fascinating. And that's where I want to dive a layer deeper, because I think this is where it starts to get really, really interesting. One of the things that you, you said in there um, is kind of, you know, being you know, emotionally open. And one thing we're often told in our society, I th think this is particularly um, specific in American society is to, to challenge those negative thoughts that you have. Like when you, yeah. when you hear you're not good enough, tell yourself that you are good enough, you know, and don't think negative and always think positive. And I think people hear that and that like that resonates with them because I think they've heard that since they were a little kid. Sure. Yet ACT brings a very, very different perspective to that. And personally speaking, a very refreshing perspective to that. So can unpack that concept of, you know, positive thinking a little bit more and how that maybe isn't the most effective way to be psychologically flexible. Well, you can easily try this out as an experiment. If you just uh, try to form the thought, uh, I'm a wonderful, perfectly well-made whole human being. And if you try to grab onto that, you'll hear a little voice saying, no, you're not. What about that? What about the time you did that? What about the time you let down your friend? What about the time that you, you said things that weren't true? What are the times that you weren't, you know, one of the times that you did things that were, you know, conversely, if you go to the worst, you, say, you go to the other race, you say, I'm the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, nobody can get worse than me. They say, oh, come on, you're not that bad. Even four-year-olds understand goofy with horns on one shoulder and goofy with a halo on the other shoulder. Does that sound like peace of mind to you? Now, it's true if you try to think positively, you get an initial pop. It feels good. It looks like it's going to work well. But that smaller voice that you sometimes try to push away, of, no, you're not, also gets pulled. 
And now there's a little background fight going on. Which is it? Of course, uh, both of these things po point to things that are in your history. It's not like one is completely false and one is completely true. But what we can say for sure is just like in those cartoons you watch when you're a kid, uh, you know, those two goofies are going to fight. And no one of them is ever going to win. So what if we did something different? What if we just kind of stepped back and watched it more the way you'd watch a cartoon show? And you know that part of your mind's going to do the horn thing and part of your mind's going to do the halo thing. And what if it's like would be okay? Not okay, like even like it, but, or, but just okay, like Roger, check, got it, okay. You know, I see that going on in me with a sense of equanimity and openness. Maybe I can learn from it. What do you mean learning from it? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, here's an example. People who have been abused are more likely to be abused again. How unfair is that? I mean, the last people on the freaking planet who should be abused again are the people who are the most likely to be abused again. How does that happen? Well, one way it happens, I know I got some emails saying you're blaming the victim, but I'm not. I'm empowering people. One way it happens is if you do the natural, logical, reasonable, sensible, and pathological thing of pushing down your pain, covering it up, and not noticing it, you gradually don't read your own emotions early on in relationships that tell you, watch out, this guy's not safe. You become alexithymic. You don't know. You, you know. You're so used to not observing and describing your own emotions and sensations because they contain a lot of painful history, not great to look at, that you begin to not know your own body, your own cues, your own emotions. Your, you know, and so the source of wisdom, which is experience, gets cut off at the pass. And so you, if you want to predict that horrible finding that people have been abused are going to be abused again, put in emotional openness or alexithymia, which is the chronic effect of being so emotionally closed off that you can't even learn the language for what you're feeling. And it completely removes that relationship. A hundred percent of what that relationship is, is that because it's so painful and hard to look at, you've tried not to. You dare not do that. Because what you're doing is you're saying, because it's so painful, I will not allow myself to learn from that pain. Well, what would you learn? One thing, things like who's safe and who isn't. What else? What you care about. How would you show it? Well, for example, activism, doing something, me too. I'm going to speak it out loud. Think about what has happened in our culture as women, for example, who are told that if you're the subject of abuse, the problem is you, suppress it, run from it, and have found in their sisters and allies the capacity to say, me too, which is an acceptance move. It's I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to see it. I'm going to look it straight on. It's going to hurt like hell. Well, that can be scaled. So, uh, you know, the logical, reasonable, sensible thing is not necessarily the, the right thing to do. It's logical, but not psychological. And so we're not used to dealing with historical factors. And we're trying to do things with our psychology that's tantamount to somebody being upset about the Grand Canyon and thinking that, you know, we'll just fill it all up with dirt again. It's not going to happen. That groove has happened. That's in your history. Can you learn from it, use it, and actually take action to pre prevent and change things that shouldn't be happening in the world that are painful? So um, I think the data are on our side. And, uh, you know, what we found with CBT Act is part of CBT. The traditional methods of detecting, challenging, disputing, and changing have weakened so because the data are just not very good component analyses and studies on pathways of change, that most traditional CBT folks have become kind of what we call third wave, bringing in values, mindfulness, acceptance, ACT, DBT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, the big three reasons as to why. And our data sets are so voluminous now that what most people do is they think of the part that sounds like classic 
CBT, not so much don't think that, think this, they think of it more like this way. In addition to thinking that, you could also think this, which one's most helpful to you? Well, I'm perfectly fine with that, that's great. Have a flexible mind, think many, many things. But the only way you're gonna do that is by stepping back, getting a little bit of perspective, and then allowing your mind to give you many things without having to immediately say, which one's true with a capital T, but just say, well, let them land. Which one's useful? Which one's orients you help in a more helpful way? And when we've done that, our classic kind of act measures or processes of change explain the impact of traditional CBT because the traditional processes of change in CBT didn't work very well. It doesn't really happen that your, your negative thoughts go away. That's not how it works. So instead of trying to do happy, happy, joy, joy, positive thoughts all the time, which is a fool's errand, let's figure out a way to be whole human beings with the painful parts of our history, not in the interest of wallowing, but learning, and then find the flexibility to then direct our attention after we've extracted that value towards what we really wanna create in our life. And that's the formula that I think is becoming very mainstream in all of evidence-based therapy, including CBT and ACT has been helpful to that. Yeah, that's, I feel like there's so many ways I could possibly follow up on all that. I, I'm not sure if it's from one of your publications or possibly Russ Harris, because I've read some of his sure. works, but one of the things that is used as a metaphor often in ACT is the idea of, of dropping the rope uh, yeah. and, and I find that very useful because I think we've all experienced that struggle in our mind that you just so eloquently talked about of, you know, I'm this way. No, I'm not. I'm this way. No, I'm not. And you literally feel like you're in a tug of war with yourself. And it's very unnatural to think you could just drop that rope. But on some mm -hmm. level, that's what it amounts to. No, it's a good metaphor because it really is something that's not intuitive when I show it in workshops. I'll throw the rope at somebody and I'll say in between you and me is a great pit. And if I pull you into it, you're going you're to fall and fall to, uh, to your death. And this is like the anxiety monster that I am here. Grab that rope. Now I'm going to pull you in. And everybody pulls back, pulls back, pulls back. And it's shocking how long. I mean, sometimes the audience is almost screaming at them before it even occurs to them. They have an alternative here. Let go of the rope. And if they do, I say, oh, and I hear grab this. And they grab it again. And I start pulling again. So, you know, there's a certain part of us that easily gets hooked into this. A client came up with that many years ago, early on in my act journey. Uh, Judith, if you're listening, I'm still thinking about you. I, I got an email from her about 10 years ago. I didn't know where she lives. But uh, Judith came up with a couple cl classic act metaphors that are out there. A lot of our act work came from our clients, not from us. Because people see it and they're wiser. And what she said on the exit interview, they had this really, really good course of dealing with anxiety and panic and so forth. And she said, you know, the hardest thing for me to learn is that it wasn't my job to win this tug of war with my anxiety. It was my job to drop the rope. And, you know, that there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around the world who benefited from that insight that she had, which itself is kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the things it shows, and it's kind of an example of why you don't want to be suppressing and avoiding, is your contact with some of these issues not only will help you, it may help others. And, you know, I think uh, our whole culture needs to be wiser. And, uh, you know, Judith has had a little role of that. And uh, her just working out her individual uh, thing. But it's counterintuitive, but it's not crazy. One reason I like metaphors, and I even act them out, is that you can see, you know, in some areas, it's like this, you know, like, you know, if you ever get in a bog or something, Boy Scout 101, lie out on the surface of it, the more surface area you can give to it, the fewer pounds per square inch, you're not going to sink into that mud. If you try to fight your way out, you're, the suction itself will pull you down. And every time you lift one foot, you've just decreased your surface area by half because the other foot is carrying your entire weight down you go. I mean, it helps for people to say, oh, you know, I would know that. If I ever got stuck in some sort of peat bog, I would probably lay out on flat, on flat on top of it. Okay, metaphorically, if you're into a, an anxiety thing, what is life asking you to lay out flat on to increase your contact with? And from there, maybe safe to roll right out of it. I'm not saying you have to live inside a a peat bog, but for goodness sakes, don't kill yourself trying to get out. And so 
Eck uses a lot of metaphors. And the reason is, is the analytic judgmental problem solving mind is viewed as part of the core of the problem. It's great for certain kinds of problems. It's horrible for other kinds of problems. And so this paradox of the modern world that if you had to pick a moment to be born, right now would be the best if you didn't know where you're gonna be born because there's lower rates of poverty, illness, longer longevity, lower rates of violence, despite all what you see in the television screen right now, less enslavement and so on, less abuse and so on, right now is the best time to be born. And at the same time, young people today are standard deviation worse in terms of stress, anxiety, and depression. What's up with that? You know, something's wrong when we can be talking across thousands of miles, you and I, and we can be doing all these wonderful things. Well, it's because the roots are the same. The very same mind that gives us this technology that allows us to carry a computer in our pocket will use that technology to show us the constant diet of uh, horror, judgment, and comparison. And will ask us to be mindful across time, space, and person of the entire world and know what's happening to the polar ice caps and the, you know, the infection rates in Brazil. And my, my wife's Brazilian. And I'm looking at that almost every day or in India that, you know, where you've got this huge expansion that probably only monks had before back in the day. And, the, and at the same time, this toxic trad of pain, comparison, and judgment. And at the same time, being actively encouraged to do things that are unhelpful, you know, drink the right beer, get enough, you know, YouTube likes. Oh, please. I mean, doesn't anyone know that's empty? Of course you do. So we're feeding our kids cotton candy. We're challenging them with things that, you know, that is beyond imagination before the technology we've had. And we've uh, given them almost nothing to to be of use and the spiritual and religious traditions that did a pretty good job are weakening. None of the above is the biggest religious group, fastest growing religious group in the modern era. So boy, uh, but to be a young person today and growing up at age 12 and, you know, knowing things that you and I probably wouldn't know to were 20, you know, they knew when they're practically 10, etc. Wow. Well, that's a hard thing. And we better help them create, minds that can step up to that challenge or will reap the wind. Yeah, one thing that strikes me with that, just our, our culture in general, is, is we are a very goals-driven culture. And one yeah. of the things I find fascinating about ACT is ACT does not focus on goals so much as focus on values. And I'll, people hear those things and, they, and they, it seems like it's a fuzzy distinction, but when you start to unpack it, you start to realize the power that exists in leading a life that is values driven versus one that is achievement or goal oriented. So maybe unpack that element of yeah, it. Yeah, it's really important. You know, goals are great along the way, as long as they're along a values-based journey, but as a substitute for that, you will be mocked by your success. I mean, millionaires and billionaires commit suicide every freaking day, every day. And we know something about how that misery happens. They start taking the money and using it to self-soothe, using it as a substitute for a life well lived, as a substitute for a values-based journey. Values are the qualities of being and doing it you want to put in your life. They're the things that are intrinsic to your behavior, and it's easy to, to get to. You either take the things that really hurt, flip them over, and say, what do you care about such that that hurt? If you've been betrayed in relationships and it stabbed you through the heart, it means you care about loyalty and intimacy in relationships. If you take the sweetest moments you've ever had in the domain, you say, what was sweet about that? And you unpack it, you're going to find your values there. There's something in there that you did or that you experienced that you really kind of want in your life. If you think of a hero, a guide of somebody who you really look up to in any given domain, especially dames, domains you're dealing with. And then you slow it down and unpack. Why was that person a hero to you? Very likely dig deep enough, you're going to find values in there. The people who uplift you, uplift you in part because of what they stand for. Uh, and there's a, a, a final method, which is if you're writing a story of your life and could up be, up, be up to you what the theme is, not just what the elements are, what theme would you want to put in there? That's a, that's a values question. Now, why would that matter? 
those values you have now, they're not tomorrow, they're not yesterday, they're not hoped for. At the moment that you affirm it, you know, like, I want to be a loving person. I want to help others. I want to be compassionate. I want to make a difference. I want to create. I want to help people appreciate beauty. I don't, I don't know what it is. There's 101 different things it could be. But the moment that you see it as something that's intrinsic to your action and you own it, you have it. And it's never going to be finished. No matter how, if you're on a journey of being a loving person, just affirming that is a loving thing to do. And every little step along the way, if you're holding yourself to it, you won't always, but when you slip, slip and fall and redirect, that's a loving thing to do. When you do loving things for people, that's a loving thing to do. You're on that journey. Well, when are you finished with it? When is the goal met? When do you have it? When, you, when can you put it in a bank account? When can you put it in a box, take a picture, put it in a book, pull it out and see there, see there it is. You can't. You can do that with goals. You can do that with degrees. You can do that with marriage certificates. You can do that with money. You can do that with a house. You can do that with a Tesla. You can do that with anything, but not values. So you have them the instant you own them. They'll guide you as long as you choose to allow them to. They'll give you direction, meaning and purpose, and you never achieve them. You only reflect them in the present. And the next moment, ask the question, do you want to do that again? It's up to you. It doesn't have to. No, it's keeping score. You can say what your values are and you can change your values. But so this future oriented, I'll be happy when, I'll be okay when. No, you won't. You won't. If you say, I'll be happy when I have a million dollars. Dude, when you get the million dollars, you're going to be worried about whether or not you're of interest to people because you have a million dollars. You'll be looking at your own experience and saying, yeah, but I still feel this with your million dollars. Now, if you want to do it, a million dollars is great, but what's the values reason there? What do you want to do with it? You want to create something? You want to contribute to something? You want to lift? Okay, great. And in fact, money predicts happiness if it's part of values and predicts misery if it's not. Research has been done on that. So what are you chasing money for if you haven't taken the time to think about what is this really about? And this is a conversation between you, you and the person in the mirror. You can't give this to your mama. You can't give this to a wagging finger. Even if you gave it to a holy book, all of those books say, and you have to affirm it. They say, here it is, but you have to knock on the door before it's opened. You know, So there, there is no wisdom tradition that says, that values just get put on you like a, a suit of clothing without any action on your part. You've got to look at that person in the mirror and say, what am I up to? What do I want? What do I want in the deepest sense of what do I want to be about? What is my best self? And pain, joy, heroes, and authorship, uh, owning the authorship of your own life are, are the four ways in I know to clarify that and without it you know like we've done things like bring mindfulness into western culture and whoops forgot to deal with right action you know the values part of the mindfulness traditions well that's just dangerous you get selfish mindfulness you know you take care of the kids i gotta go meditate oh come on dude what are you doing that's not what that's for it's not for self-soothing you want to do self-soothing drink a beer but, you know, it's, it's kind of sad what has happened uh, with the goal pursuit being ripped away from its natural home of uh, owned values. I wouldn't even say values pursuit because at the moment you own them, you have them. And then it's more like working on how to create habits around them. And that's a lifelong issue. You'll never fully be, I mean, you're not going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama that, that's, uh, or any other spiritual leader, very likely, uh, you know, pursue it, keep working, keep working, keep working. That's the process. But uh, first you got to start with what, what do you want to be about? So, so, so empowering to, to be able to, to truly own that. Uh, so as if people are listening to this and, and, 
I'm sure this is resonating with a lot of people because we all have our struggles and our challenges, particularly now coming out of COVID. We know, you know mental health is, is a, a big struggle for many, many people. H- how do you recommend getting started on the journey to connect with ACT? Because you, you've mentioned these the different domains and then the six different processes of kind of psychological flexibility. Like, how does somebody begin to engage with this to move them on the right path? Well, fortunately, I mean, you can do it for like no money. You can go to Facebook groups or you can join free um, groups. Like there's one in groups.io called Act for the Public. I mean, you can get really good Act self-help books for 12 bucks. You can probably buy Muse for five bucks. I mean, it really gets down to that point. And um, so uh, just the, the what's there on YouTube and all the rest. I mean, so if you're interested search for acceptance and commitment therapy or acceptance and commitment training when it's used outside of a therapy context and business and so forth, some are used with training or psychological flexibility and avail yourself uh, of what's out there. Uh, in the session notes for this, we'll, I'll give you a link to my, um, my own uh, website. And if you uh, want to get a newsletter from me and send out about once a month, I'll, I'm happy to do that. You just have to go and log in. I don't spam people. And you can stop with a one-click opt-out if it ever gets obnoxious. But I think once it's kind of like, you know, when you're going to buy a car and then you suddenly see the cars everywhere. If you've never heard of ACT before and now you start looking around, you're going to see it. Uh, Because it's just out there and it's at a level because of the data. uh, You mentioned COVID. I mean, if you went to the World Health Organization website and you wanted to get help with COVID, there's only one thing they will give you, an ACT cartoon book. Why? Because it was tested with South Sudanese refugees in Uganda and shown that what's called scalable psychological interventions is help with dealing with the entire range of stressors that happen when people are in very stressful environments. And when COVID happened, they didn't have any randomized trials for how to deal with COVID, but they looked around and said, what's the best done randomized trial that we have been participating in, we as World Health Organization, that helps people with almost any kind of problem that having to do with a challenging environment. And there it was. And it's now been replicated a couple of times that that's not yet fully announced yet, but uh, the World Health Organization is gonna be distributing it, not just for uh, COVID, but for all kinds of challenging situations like natural storms and wars and torture and climate change, all of that. Uh, around the world in you know, 15, 20 different languages. So that's an example. It's just everywhere, you know? And so not everywhere. I mean, a lot of people say, I've never heard of ACT. Yeah, but it, it's enough there that uh, whether you're talking about sports or diet or exercise or physical challenges or mental health challenges, it's there. Now, one thing that I do want to say that you said, you know, we're all realizing that mental health is important. Here's one thing we're realizing we went through an era where we biomedicalized human suffering and put it into syndromal categories and thought that did it. We understand it. We know what to do. No, it didn't do it. We didn't understand it. And we didn't know what to do because it really didn't work very well. These average categories put atop people. Uh, I'll give an example, a very large study called star D 4,000 patients, many, many millions spent by NIH on testing different ways of helping people with major depression, 4,000 people. How many different constellations of signs and symptoms? It's not that long a set. It's this relatively small set inside the diagnostic system. How many unique combinations were in the 4,000 people? And the answer is 1,100. How many people had a combination that was so rare that there was only four other people or fewer who had the same kind of depression as they did out of 4,000 people? In other words, how many people were at one-tenth of 1% in terms of their unique characteristics? More than half. So you're reading these things. Here's what to do when you're depressed. More than half or at one-tenth of 1%. What are you talking about? And so... You know, we have to go more to, I think, a different view, which is stop chasing hidden diseases. Start thinking of mental health the way you think of physical health. Your physical strength and your physical flexibility is to be worked on your entire life. You don't wait till you're injured and say, oh, I guess I have to exercise. 
You don't wait till you're 400 pounds and say, ooh, I guess nutrition might be important. You don't wait till you're getting three hours of sleep a night and then say, mm, is sleep important? You know, those are health practices, right? And don't we all know that our strength and flexibility is critical to the physical health journey we're on? The same thing is true with mental strength and flexibility. So it's not the one out of five who have the syndromes. It's the five out of five, that's all of us, that need to be working on our mental strength and our mental flexibility the same way we work on our physical strength and our physical st flexibility. Namely, early, often, and throughout your life. That's it. It's, it's not a sometimes thing. It's a 24-7, 365 days a year thing. You don't have to be obsessed with it. And in fact, if you get the momentum, if you learn the skills, it's just like exercise. You get good at it. You can keep that muscle tone and flexibility without a huge amount of time and effort. Same thing with your mental strength and flexibility. And the great message of the COVID year is it's not one out of five. It's five out of five. It's not one hour a week. It's 24 seven. And we better get on about the business of learning how to put the wisdom that comes from behavioral science, respectfully looking at what we've learned from our wisdom traditions, our cultural journey, what we've learned from experience itself and learning how to put that into our schools and our businesses and our families and our church groups and our choirs and our uh, uh, you know, clubs and, our, and into our daily lives. It's not that hard. You can do this. And if you had to pick one thing, you mentioned my book uh, or my earlier one, Get Out of Mind Into Your Life, um, you know, a few bucks and that'll give you going. But it, it, you mentioned Russ Harris, an awesome uh, author, a physician on Australia who's really good at writing simply. I, I'm working on it still. I'm kind of a geek. But um, so with the cost for a few books or this the free cost of the time to get on the internet and look around a little bit, uh, you can have pretty good guidance if, from others in these Facebook groups and listeners and from the written word, spoken word, YouTube things and online courses and all the rest. And of course, therapists, if you go to contextualscience.org, which is the group that's developing ACT, about 10,000 professionals around the world, about half of them outside of North America, literally around the world with 40 chapters and 20 some different languages. Um, if you go there, there's a little thing of find and act therapist. And there's about 6,000 people who are listed there. And a lot of them do teletherapy and stuff. So if, if you need therapy and need help, and you're interested in act, you can easily get it that way. Yeah, so many amazing resources. And we're going to link up to all of those in, in the show notes. Um, I will say that I know a number of people personally who have used a lot of the, the books and the other resources that are out there just to get acquainted with this. And we can't do justice to the decades of research and work that you and your colleagues have done in an hour podcast. But I, I truly hope we've given people a, at least a, a big enough taste of this to realize that this concept of psychological flexibility is something that can alleviate suffering and, and lead to flourishing. It, it does both on both ends of the spectrum. It does. And that's a really important thing. There are a lot of things out there that will alleviate suffering, but don't lift up flourishing. And, you know, you take an example, anti-anxiety meds will alleviate the, the problem of anxiety, but it's not going to hold your hand and create a life worth living. In fact, if you're not careful, you, they're addictive. There's lots of problems there. So you really want to be focused on what do you really want? Of course, you want alleviation from the negative, but you also want a life worth living. And you should expect of all of the therapies and methods out there, two things. One, can they show through science that they will give you a good chance of achieving what you really want? Two, do they know enough about how that it works that they can tell you what the actual processes of change are that will take you there? And if, you, if it's woo-woo, they can't do that. They can't point to the studies. If it's just uh, early sort of, oh, this might help, and they don't really understand it, they can't explain the processes. So I think you should ex expect both as a consumer and 
um, you know, ACT isn't the only thing. There's many good evidence-based things out there, but it's uh, an important thing to know about. And um, that flourishing message, that's part of that one, uh, that five out of five message. Yeah, one out of five, we're dealing with real kind of diagnosable mental illness, but five out of five of us are wanting to know how to live our lives in, in powerful ways that produce mental, physical, and social well-being. And um, we know a lot about how to do that. So let's get on with creating a culture and also, you know, kind of starting with yourself. You know, I get letters from people, you know, I see this in my family. I see this in my kids. How can I, how can I deal with that? I'd always say, start with yourself. Because just when I said, like, pick a guide, pick somebody you'd look up to, what do they stand for? Can I, can I take a minute just to do this, just to show how powerful this is? Actually do that. Pick somebody who lifted you, you up powerfully in your life, who empowered you, really put, you know, kind of uh, uh, was a good guide and support for you in your life. Somebody you actually know. And then I got to give you six questions. When you're around them, did you feel profoundly accepted for who you are? Were you kind of constantly being judged? Or was judgment kind of out of the room a little bit? Were, were they are there with you and your eyes met? Could you see consciousness there? Like they were conscious of you being here, you were connected? Were they looking at their watch trying to figure out how to end this interaction? Or were they sort of fully with you in the present when they were there? If you cared about something, wanted something, something's important to you, would they ride over that without a second thought? Have you done things that you really don't want to do or uncomfortable to do, violate your values? Would they do that? Or would they be respectful of that? And could you be together in ways that fit the opportunities of the moment? That you could, you know, maximize your time together or was it always one way, rigid, determined by them? You don't have a voice in it. Those are the six flexibility processes of, you know, emotional and cognitive openness, awareness in the present, values and habits around built around our values that take advantage of our opportunities. So here, here's what I can say. If you answer them the way I'm pretty confident you answered it, you are lifted up and empowered by people who modeled for you a more psychologically flexible approach to life. Well, that's a wise model. And, that's, and you saw it because you knew it was relevant. So do the things that would help put that kind of guidance into your heart and into your head and into your hands and create a life around that. And science will help you do that. But frankly, I'm back to the theme of you can trust it because you'll recognize it. You know it. You can feel it. You can sense it that this is a wiser thing to do than, you know, heads over your head with your buckled down into a fetal position waiting for life to end or for the pain to go away before you can stop living before you can start living. So uh, I hope I've been useful. And I would say to you one final thing, if somebody uh, of sensing that we may be coming to the end, if somebody's up, feels at all connected to some of what I've said, I know I've done some rants. I'm sorry for that. Uh, doing a little bit too much of that, Michael, but if you are lifted up by it, there's something there that's intriguing. I will, been doing this for 40 years. If you have that reaction and you pursue it, it's going to yield benefits. Conversely, if you've listened and this just seems like goofy, silly stuff that doesn't land, eh, maybe uh, other things to pursue that are also evidence-based and useful. Um, but uh, if you all do want to pursue it, the resources are out there at low cost or no cost. And uh, uh, the benefits are known to be there from the scientific validation that we spent 40 years building for these approaches. That's great. Uh, Dr. Hayes, I think I could probably listen to you talk for hours and hours and hours on end. Uh, so much richness to uh, your experience and your wisdom. And we're going to link up to as many things as we possibly can that we talked about in the show notes. Uh, I just thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom and your experience with us. Uh, it's been a great honor to have a, chat, a chance to have this conversation with you. It's been great. Thanks for the opportunity.
Well, I truly hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Hayes as much as I did. If you found it insightful and informative, please share with your friends and colleagues and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. More information about Dr. Hayes, ACT, and anything we talked about during the podcast can be found on the show notes page for this episode by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode five. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well.